All right, uh, I'm Joanne Gavin, director of the Furious Flower Poetry Center. Yeah, got a fan back there. That's wonderful. Um, and it's always a joy to come to these poetry readings because for me, it's a just verification that JMU is the black poetry planet. We, we love poetry here at JMU. And I also can say very clearly that I love the woman I'm going to present today. Our poet, Vivi Francis, said, quote, that her primary interest is in poetics, particularly how poetry is made and the value of such deliberate creative practice, end quote. I would say that her poetics are as textured and layered as Detroit's diverse culture that she loves, and as expansive as the Texas landscape where she was raised. She teaches poetry with the objective to, quote, upturn how we think about poetry, its lineage, and the cultural impact of received aesthetics, end quote. I would say she has midwifed a generation of younger poets in Detroit and around the world as they have emerged with their own strengths and a mind to insist on their own ways of considering and reconsidering the common mythologies around what a poem should be, what a poem should do, and any other prescriptive requirements. Vivi Francis has led by example. She is the author of three volumes of poetry, Blue Tail Fly, Horse in the Dark, and Force Primeval, which was the winner of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award as well as the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry. In fact, it was my pleasure to be on hand and permit and, and present that award to her in Washington, D.C. about two years ago. She also won the Kaveh Kana Northwestern University Press Prize and was recognized as a notable debut uh, for Poetry, Poets and Writers magazine. She is an associate professor of creative writing at Dartmouth College and an associate editor of the journal that we call Kalaloo. The poet, Adrian <coughs> Matika, describes her poems as revelations of memory, of dust, of the cotton and marginalia strung together to make history. In a poem that I love, I've been reading this uh, book for a while, Ars Poetica, she writes, I keep rifles in the front closet. Trespassing can be a glance, a good shot. I practice with bullets. I'm sorry, I practice with bottles bullseyes. I cross the line where the fence breaks, where the wood falls in unintended directions, and prepare an offensive before any repair. I know the value of my property. Ungloved, I place the barbed wire. Would you help me to welcome the fierce, the wild, <laughs> the brilliant, visionary poet, Vivi Francis. It's wonderful being here at JMU. 
I'm having an excellent time, and that's difficult. I don't usually have an excellent time. They've made me smile so much that my cheeks have started to hurt. So, and anyone who knows me knows that I'm given to the frown, so that's really wonderful and um, really grateful for Furious Flower and what it does for the landscape, how it opens things up and allows a poet such as myself to be seen. I'm going to read from this book, Forest Primeval, and to give you just a little background, I had been living in Detroit for 30 years, and my husband said, well, I've got a job in western North Carolina, and I'd like you to come with me. Well, he's a writer too, a poet, and I said, lots of writers live apart. You go on to North Carolina, and I'll stay here in Detroit. And that's not what happened. He calls me Bunny, and he said, Bunny, I need you. I can't do it without you. Remember these things if you decide to marry, right? Okay. <laughs> so I followed him to Western North Carolina, and having been in Detroit, I thought I was tough. I thought, I can handle anything. Those mountains unraveled me. I had never lived in the mountains before. <laughs> Everything terrified me. The bears. The, in, the infestations of bugs that went over the hills. Oh my gosh, everything, snakes in the house, okay. So I had to contend with who I was as an urban person. I had to rewrite my narrative. I had to deal with the wilderness, which soon sent me on a raging campaign against the pastoralist and eventually having beef with Longfellow hence naming my book Forest Primeval. I'm like, oh, we're gonna talk about the forest, right? We're gonna have a real talk because everything in America bites, so. <laughs> and I wrote a series of anti-pastorals, so I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna move this equipment over just a little bit. Another anti-pastoral. I want to put down what the mountain has awakened, my mouth full of grass, my curious tail. I want to stand still but find myself moved patch by patch. There's a bleed in my throat. Words fail me here. Can you understand I sink to my knees, tired or not? I now know the ragweed from the goldenrod and the blinding beauty of green. Don't you see, I'm shedding my skin. I'm a paper hive, a wolf spider, the creeping ivy, the ache of a birch, a heifer, a doe. I have fallen from my dream of progress, the clear-cut glass, the potted and balconied tree, the lemon-waxed wood over a marbled pillar into my own nocturne, the lullabies I had forgotten. How could I know what slept inside, what would rend my fantasies to cud, and up from this belly's wet straw-strewn field, these soundings. So I'm going to go back and forth between the discoveries I made um, in the mountains near Asheville, North Carolina, and Detroit for a minute. And there's a fly buzzing around, which is very, very distracting. OK. Ah. If I kill it, will anybody be upset? Okay. For, for the Buddhist in the house, I'm sorry. Okay. Taking it for Gabby and Jen. I never remember the knuckles, though his hand was bare, though their hands were bare. I remember the impressions left on this skin, the wilting and the welting. I don't remember the sound, not one smack. I remember the falls, myself falling to the floor or sidewalk or against the brick wall my head met after a push. There were many pushes. Girls pushed, but I punched. Pulled one down by the hair and kneed her as my own head bled. Girls didn't punch until high school. I had always punched. My father asked, what kind of girl are you? The kind who wants to live, I said. And I did want to, until I didn't anymore. But I wanted the leaving to be on my own terms, so I hit my father back. 
He owned me like any good country father. He waited for a husband to tame what he couldn't corral, to throw a rope like fingers round a neck. When I missed a boy, finger holds, I remember those, and me making a fist wrongly and punching, and I didn't mean to miss, but to hit that line below the belly, the belt line. When broke me in the snow, my first year north, I'm still afraid to say his name. I wore shoes too thin for the weather. Who had ever seen such snow and had a Georgia lilt like molasses on a sore throat, sugared, raw, and he hated the sound of it. He was black and I was black and I was so happy to be in Detroit. And he aimed for my heart-shaped mouth, my gap teeth, my too sweet tongue. I felt the juvenile weight of him above me like snow after dark, falling steady and hard. He said, I'm going to teach you to talk regular. And I stopped speaking at all. I kept my swollen mouth shut and a straight razor in my math book and dreamt of a bat to crack against his chest. A woman like me, ultimately with soft hands, not hands of the field like my grandmother, but hands meant to stroke and soothe, needs a weapon. So I studied the art of war and watched boxing. And where else was all this rage to go? Is this too dramatic? Find another story, find a lie. In love, body after body fell beneath my own, though my own was broken. And I made love like a sea creature, fluid as if boneless, though my bones would rattle if not for this fat I cherish, wouldn't you? And how I grew to love the heavyweights, myself with one in the ring, imagined him punching me and punching me again, saying, I'm sorry, so sorry to have to love you this way. Wow. Like <laughs> Like Jesus to the crows. Like Jesus to the crows that gathered there along his arms upon the invitation of a slender limb and not oblivious to human violence, perhaps needed rest or needed to offer the succor of presence despite the stiff collar of their feathers, despite each one being no less the children of a father who claimed an upper realm. It is not true they pecked his eyes nor did they consider his wounds their own. They were neither irreverent nor quiet. They spoke in the tongues they knew. They cawed full-voiced and would have released him from his bindings had their beaks held the power and had there been time in that place. Like them, I have sought to comfort and be so comforted. Like them, I have seen the failure of miracles when they were most needed. Like him, I have called upon those so unlike myself when my own father failed to answer. <coughs> Fallen, but I was never the light of my father's eyes or any other brothers, that deep husk choir. So there was no height from which to fall. I began here in the proverbial bottom, undertow, base from which one may rise but briefly. Like the failing horse, knowing it must now race, must tear out of its rusted gate, must further tear the pleuritic lining of its lungs, let its tongue loll ugly from the side of its mouth. Have you seen such a thing? Its brown coat salted with sweat as it lunges forward and lunges again, forcing its measure not up but out, knowing its ankles could fold under such weight. Its nose opened into another being, sucking and snorting the only thing it takes within it that does not judge it, the air, the sweet, sweet air as it makes its way around a curve that might kill it, that assuredly will kill it. Do you see me there? Of course not. I'm over here, here in this hollow, running for my low life. Oh, Father, for the rub of a hand over my back. Oh, brothers, for the gold leaf wreath 
that might have meant a stroke of my calf. For that, I stretch these legs to breaking. I wrench this belly's hull dark as all alluvial things are. Lucifer's is a common story, a child's boogeyman. What should frighten you is this. Imagine what he would have been had he never fallen, had he never known the elusive light at all, never been privy to the cords of God's neck, if he in fact doubted such things, believing only in what anguishes and writhes, trusting nothing more than what soils his hands. Um, I am going to wave. I don't know what's happening here. Are the I think it's over there now, so I hope somebody gets it. Okay. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know. One mentions Beelzebub, and here we go. Okay. Okay. This is just... <laughs> oh, excuse me. Okay. Skinned. So I began in Texas... And I feel like life began for me on my grandmother's farm um, in East Texas in the deep piney woods. But then I spent 30 years in the urban north and did my best to run from what I'm of, to forget what I was, skinned. There are, after all, several ways to skin anything. My grandmother knew most of those ways. She had been skinned herself, so to speak, and that her skin was so often examined and found wanting. What would one want to do with it, really? Despite the constant oiling, which left her arms soft as anyone could possibly desire, her hands were in ruins. She never hit me with them. My grandfather took her with her hands at her sides. Laundry water, cotton bowls, horsehide, the blood of goats, she had to cook and I had to eat. She could skin a raccoon in minutes, revealing the purple flesh easy as snapping a guinea neck. She would have given anything to wake up in a new skin, though hers was delightful in the light. But what did I know? The toil took its toll. And though her face barely wrinkled, her knees and elbows darkened into the skin I wear now roughened into the heels I scratch against a husband's calves because I don't listen. I refuse to wear shoes. I'm as country as she didn't want me to be. I loved the way she smelled, like outdoors, like new sheets, like hot grease and rifle burn, cream of wheat with coffee, front porch, corn cob. Her skin held all she did her best to scrub free, scrub so hard it liked to take the skin right off of her which is what she wanted, to have it off on her own terms, not the eyes that demonized her, unsightly, dirty, unseemly. She saved for crinolines and lace, for pretty gloves and wide-brimmed hats to hide her skin. Mine is mottled, stress-blemished, but soft as hers, and I know it. Easy enough to remove. As a girl, I tried to burn it off, to find the pink I was convinced lay beneath. I'm not the first. I wore scarves she made to cover the evidence of my curiosity. Now I give myself over to the lotions of the day, disparage the oils she did not love but felt she needed. She'd stroke my cheek and say, good baby, and I'd feel good in my skin in that moment. I'd hold her tight and whisper, you are the prettiest and she'd feel good in hers. I want to forget, but I have my mirrors, and there she is, shadowed in a sunstruck field. <laughs> this poem is for my little sister, and I was in Georgia recently. I, I don't read in the South very much, but I was in Georgia, Augusta recently, and I read this poem, and we had quite a conversation about this poem after. It's for my little sister, who's 15 years my junior, and she's born and raised um, around Detroit. When I first told her about my childhood, she was shot. She didn't believe it. She said no one could think that way. She said, it's impossible 
that you could have been treated that way. She said, the world is not that way. But I remember, and I remember everything. I did not think I'd make it to 54 years old when I was a child. Who could have made it in such a world? So this poem is for her, who will never have to endure the stereotypes I've had to endure and thankfully no longer have to endure. Salt for Vidra, <coughs> Miami, Florida. Allergic to fish, shellfish or otherwise, my sister shouts, watermelon, when surprised by a fruit dinner at the resort where she and I are sharing sister time, something we rarely do. I am old enough to be her aunt or even her mother, 15 years older in fact, and like a mother, I take delight in her delight. She won't be hungry this evening. The chef has prepared something especially for her, having no idea what she looks like, only that a temporary resident needs something beyond seafood. Only the fruit is untainted. A gentleman from Georgia sits with us as we wait on our dinner. He from a good family, strong values, can go back several generations, looks at me directly into my black pupils, and I know what he knows. And we begin to laugh hysterically at the mule train, the wagon, the dust track of my sister's outburst. He laughs for all the expected reasons, and I I laugh because somewhere I want to cry. The landscape under my breast, topography of pines, clay bottom land, roofs of tin, and the lie of it. The fruit so sweet, red, and now seedless. He and I both know how delicious such things can be, but he can eat his without shame, without notice. And my sister, in all her Yankee naivete or innocence, knows only that she is being served a treat, something that won't swell her throat, noose her breath, while he and I share our secret through grins, giggling until we damn near choke. Wolf, my father and I have a complicated relationship, a challenging relationship. We've forgiven each other, we've grown, but there are things about me that just irritate the man. I don't blame him. One of those things is my love for Howling Wolf. So, Howling Wolf, do we know Howling Wolf, the blues man? Just an incredible blues man. He, he would take his guitar and he would lick the arm of it, right? Ah. Oh. anyway. I hear he was good to his wife and quite true to it. Somebody came up after a reading and said, you shouldn't write those nasty poems about Howling Wolf. He was good to his wife. I know that. <laughs> but I watched Howling Wolf. My father saw me one day and I about passed out. Howling Wolf started to howl the way he does. I swooned. My father just looked at me like, what kind of woman? Okay. And uh, not heeding him, I wrote this, Wolf. It begins with an epigraph. Um, the BBC was interviewing Howling Wolf, and they asked him where he got his name. And he said, I was a bad boy, so my daddy told me the story about the wolf and Little Red Ryan Hood. Oh, that changes the agency a little bit. The last line of this poem is a quote from Wolf. One, it's licking your doorknob. You know it's there, yes you do. Sounds so subtle, if not for the scent, you might pretend it's the rustle of needles over the porch boards. You might pretend it's a coon's back up against the pine bark, but it's there, little girl, that tongue like a language all its own. And you know it, and you know more than that. Two, I said, run. River can't help you. How's the river going to help you? All that wet pulling at you, pulling you down into more of itself. I was baptized like any other. Didn't do a thing to stop me. Just look at my mouth. Three, a wolf will make you faint. A wolf will have you happy on your knees and make you want more of the same. Four, by the time we were done, I couldn't tell me from it, it from me. Who was on the floor? Who was crying like that? Five, good jug. What do you know about it? Nothing, not yet. Six, 
By the time we finished, I knew we'd never be finished. Seven, when I meet the one who ain't a wolf, I'll let you know. Maybe. Maybe I'll keep that all to myself. Eight, I used to hide my pine-filled hunger, my breath of sawdust, my hardtack heels, enough shame to splinter a belly, enough needles to gag on, to be fucked forever. What the fuck are you looking at? Nine, oh white sock blues man, oh foul-tongued hero, shout the wolf down now, shoot the damn thing. 10, I'm a wolf, baby. You can't believe a word I say. Mm -hmm. Now you're clapping and my father would look at you side-eyed. Okay. Bluster. The epigraph reads, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. Charles Perrault, Little Red Riding Hood. I knew the path and what was on it. I wore his favorite color. He said I could just eat you up as if I were a girl whose cheeks he could pinch into a blush, pluck a bit off and pop onto his tongue. I held a rustic basket of his favorite cheeses, a board and knife. Beneath my red coat, I wore nothing. He wore short sleeves that made him seem hairier than if he had worn nothing, imbalanced somehow. The clean line of the linen, the tufts of hair spun down his arms. Every spring I took the path. Every spring he surprised me with his hair raising antics, bucking his eyes, biting his lips. He'd sharpened the edges of his teeth. He'd learned my middle name. But ask him my favorite hue, go on. And he never bothered to ask how I'd been. He had the feet of a larger wolf. He wore shoes like any huntsman. I wanted to knock mine upon them to test their strength. I said, I've been away studying. He said, don't you want to guess what I'm holding? I laughed because what else was there to do? I knew his type. He was clever, though he couldn't unsnap my lamb's wool. He cut through it with a claw in the grove. So clean a slice, you couldn't tell my cape from the blood beneath it. Just a circle, a hole. I dropped my act. I smiled a heartless smile. I arched my back and only cried a little, really. I was my grandmother's granddaughter, after all. <coughs> Paradise, Crockett, Texas. I wrote this, um, I told a poet, a uh, black poet from the North that I, uh, I was born into Jim Crow. And he said, oh, you couldn't have been. I said, what do you know about it, Mr. Ohio? He said, oh, you, you. and so we had this horrible argument. My, my husband had to get between us. And, I wrote this, Paradise, Crockett, Texas, an epigraph from Lead Belly. In the pines and the pines where the sun don't ever shine, I would shiver the whole night through. Don't tell me, I was there. And the songs are mine who slept there, who dreaded the shade of the trees at dusk, their mountain silhouette. I feared and was without shame in my fright, who wouldn't turn from that darkness. I was told to walk the property line. I was told to hold the pistol. I climbed my grandpa's feet to sit on his wide lap, my head on his barreled chest, a beggar for stories to counter the dusk. Taller than the pines, the men that marked those pines in red were slim as the pines themselves. They stood apart from us and hated us, but loved our music, our rough spun bodies for the having then. So unless your clan molders beneath those mounds, you don't know, and you can believe me or not. Tintype. My Aunt Tinny was a blues singer, a wild woman, a rough woman, a remote woman. Tintype, thunderstorm in Palestine, Texas, 3 p.m. Tin roof, tin teeth, three gold as if from a tin pan in a slow creek drawing mud, calling up catfish from the muck and that skinny man, Aunt Tinny's man never married married man. He's got his head thrown back, eyes closed for his daily claim, the way she pulls the hurt right out of him, like a long splinter whose release feels almost good, real good. He cooks but doesn't eat, doesn't need anything but what he took years back and keeps shacked in front of him. A woman tinned her own cans back then, back there, and burned trash in the backyard. You think I don't know who I am? Tin-tonguing the gap between there, 
listening with my hands stuck to my chest in the ring shout of my own feet, and now. Tin cutter, just like me to hear Tinny tell it. And once you sat on those sweat-stained couches, pot liquor spotted, love mark cushions frayed to failing, and listened to her pound the upright's keys, some tan and half-rotted black, barely standing, and the bench barely able to hold her tin-haired tin self, you won't be right. She'll mess you up if you stay too long, Tin Man. That whale wrapping its arms around you, its legs like a weighted trap. You'll cry for your mother. You'll cry like you've never cried before. Of course you will. Taking in what can't be taken in. Won't matter who you were. She'll give it to you anyway. Your heart rolled in her mouth ten times the measure. Over days, like one long road of night. Cold and hard as hail. Flying over Pigeon River for Matthew. I think of home and the way we find our way back despite the winds that threaten, the wings, and there's the daunting slope of every damn thing. More than once the gully has found me. More than that I've slid, lost my footing, ugly bird, couldn't stand. Flight was a fool's notion, and with it I have grown tenacious and scabrous. I have suffered the fall and again, but I love best the nest where you wait and I land. All kinds of howling. Wolf is just one. There's the wind between houses, cold as a tongue and a couldn't care less mouth. There's that belt or hand whistling through the air to meet a backside and the cry a woman makes when she meets her maker. Wolf is just one way to get there, to that pain that rocks your bones, rocking away. Thank you. She did that as she batted flies, <laughs> you know, and she waxed, of course, lyric and poetic. Um, I'm going to give the uh, members of the class an opportunity to hand out those surveys and do that quickly. And as they hand out the surveys, I want you to come up with questions that you want to ask. Um, uh, Bobby Francis, and I know you have them, so we're just going to give you a minute to collect yourselves and come up with a good question or two. I love questions. Any of you write poetry? Raise your hands. Right? Oh, I know more than you write that. This is how I filled up my introduction to poetry class. So I teach at Dartmouth, and Dartmouth's colors are, color, we have one color, is really green, right? So I had a sheet of paper, eight by 11. I didn't make the fancy posters like the other instructors, none of that. Plain sheet of paper, and at the top it said, poetry writing. At the bottom it said, you know you write it. And that was it, filled my poetry <laughs> class, right? Because we're all right, we're always writing it. We're putting it in our birthday cards, we're scribbling it in our journals. It's always there. Okay. Any questions? Yes? Um, when did you start writing? Uh, Jessica, stand up so she can hear you. <laughs> uh, when is it that you started writing? Um, so the question is, when did I start writing? And I was 19 years old. Um, when I started writing. Two poets, one from Canada and one from Detroit, uh, part of what they called the corridor poets, walked into a classroom and just read for us. Or I lost my mind. I'm, I looked at them and I said, wow, that's who I want to be. I couldn't believe uh, how empowered they were. And so I went home and told my parents that I'm thinking about writing poetry. Uh, yeah, OK, that went over well. So. <laughs> Another question? Yes, right here. Sorry, it's just something that kind of shocked me. You mentioned lead belly. Yes. I, I hardly know anyone who even knows who that is. So what, what got you interested in, in him or even that kind of music? It, it's so unknown to most people now. Um, well, I've been listening to blues uh, 
bluegrass, old time, country, all my life, right? Uh, my mother liked it and uh, she'd play it quite a bit. And um, over the years, I just kept meeting other people who liked it. And so people listen to Lead Belly without realizing they're listening to Lead Belly because the songs are covered, like Nirvana covered the little bit that I mentioned there. But you know, Kirk Cobain lists Lead Belly as his favorite singer. So I think people are hearing it and not really realizing it. Um, so, I, I think I loved it just because it was so available to me um, in the part of the Southwest I lived in in particular. Great question, right? My little sister, I can't get her to listen to it with me. Oh, but you, you had a poet here not long ago, I think, wasn't Tahimba Jess here? Yes, yes. And Tahimba Jess wrote an entire book in the voice of Lead Belly. Well, actually, the voice of Lead Belly and his guitar and <laughs> all of these things. And uh, so if you haven't read it, you might love it. Thank you so much. Yes, I saw another hand right over here. Yes. Stand up, please. Shut it out. <laughs> where, 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 what gives you the inspiration to start? Like, I know start is only the hardest part of my writing, but like that. So what gives you the inspiration to create such a work of art? So, so the question is, what gives me the inspiration to create? Um, well, for me, poetry is daily practice, which doesn't mean I write a poem every day, but it does mean that I read towards writing a poem, or I pay attention to the world around me towards writing a poem. So I tell my students that most of the time we learn that the muse, if you will, is external, and we're waiting for something external to act upon us. But I try to get my students to become so sensitive to the world around them that almost everything does inspire them to build the metaphoric mind. So we keep comparing things and seeing things in ways one might not originally. So I keep myself attentive and tuned in to the world around me. Right? Like if someone asks me later tonight what color your tie is, I'll be able to tell them. Right? <laughs> Another question. All right, in the back. Okay, Sorry, go ahead. I was nervous, but um, how important do you think it is to read your poetry out loud instead of just writing it on paper and back and hearing what other people are hearing from yourself? Well, let's think about that. I, I find it important to read my work aloud. Um, it, when I'm done writing a poem, I want to hear the external voice, and it helps me find the music and the rhythm for the poem. Um, but I don't write every poem to be read aloud. I do consider the voice in the reader's head, right? So when we're reading a poem, there's that voice here, and, and I think about that voice as much as I think about the external voice. So some of the poems in this book I've never read to anyone aloud outside of myself. Right? And I'm, I'm thinking that some of these poems, someone is sitting in a room somewhere, quietly reading it to themselves, but that voice inside. So I, I generally read the poem aloud for my, for, to capture my own rhythms. Right? Um, and then I love to share my work like this. And once in a while, when I'm reading a poem like this, I change things. Right? And then you see the poem in another version online, right? But um, um, it feels good to read the poems aloud. I, I feel most connected to people when I'm reading my poems to them. It's like an exchange. Great question. Another question. There's yes, one over here. Over here. Oh. Yes. What was the editing process for the book or for poem to poem? Um, I, I couldn't say that I have a specific editing process for my poems. I will say that the difference between writing a poem for yourself and entering the great conversation of poetry is revision, right? The idea of first thought, best thought is not real. First thought, most authentic thought is not real. Third thought, best thought. Fourth thought, most authentic thought. 
And when you know the history of poetry and you know where those ideas enter, then it's easy to let them go, right? So my, my process is I take the poem in, the first draft, I let happen whatever wants to happen. That's intuitive. Every draft after that is counterintuitive. It won't feel good. It's going to be difficult because I'm pushing back against collectivism. I'm pushing back against the cliche and trying to get to that thing that's mine alone. So revision is part of the process. With the book, as with most books written in poetry these days, the order of the book is almost as important as each poem. And it took me a year to order this book. I'm literally just a year spent ordering the poems. Right? And they create a poem unto themselves. So that's a very different process. But I think for you all right now, understanding revision is the key to making, moving your work from good to sublime. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. Certainly was. Another good question out there. Uh, if there's not another question, why don't you show Vavi Francis, how we appreciate poets at James Madison University, especially those poets who come for the Furious Flower Poetry Center. So would you please give her a rousing JMU thank you.